Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Marta Cáceres, and it's a great honor to be here to introduce the Primavera Award 2019. This year's message is to promote what the festival defines as the new normal. Well, in this particular case, in this case, I would not say she is new in the music scene, been there for more than three decades, neither normal as we love her unique conception of music and the place she has earned by herself in this business. Yes, she is not normal at all. In fact, she's an exception we'd like to have more often. More normal people like Nene Sherry, more respected women like Nene, more icons like you. How long it took you, Nene? How long it took us in fact, to realize that you were right, that you were a visionary, as a young singer saying, you better watch no mess with me. That inner city mama is now called, you know what I read the other day? That Nene Sherry is considered the godmother of pop. <laughs> Well, inner city mama, you've come a long way and you're where you are and you'll definitely be, to most of us, a reference, an example of commitment and authenticity and someone who delivers serious, worthy, necessary messages to this world, then and now. So as you say in one of your latest tracks, slow release, no pressure, no pressure, this prize made for you is not just another award. It's a sculpture made exclusively by Antonio Iranzo, an artist who lives in Barcelona and is given for the first time since this creation to recognize a whole contribution of a work of honesty like yours. So please, keep it. Hope you like it. Don't recycle this or upcycle, as they say now like you did once back in 1990 with one of the Brit Awards you won for that mythical role like sushi. You melted to make a jewel color, um, some huge earrings. Just kidding. <laughs> Seriously, please keep it. We love you through the years. Our love for you goes on and on and on. Your songs have been a guiding light for those who consider that pop is an instrument of resistance, a vehicle for relevant themes and deep emotions. That's why Nene Sherry deserves the Primavera Award 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nene Sherry. <clears throat> Almudena Heredero, Primavera Pro Director, and Alberto Guijarro, the Festival Director, delivered the prize. Thank you. I mean, I don't know whether I think that I really deserve this, but um, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it home and I promise not to recycle it. I'll keep it. It's actually a really beautiful award and I have to say that I feel really touched and, and really honored. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Out of like all the amazing people that are at this festival, I was like, really? Are you sure? Are you sure it's me? They don't want to like give it to someone else? <laughs> are you sure? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Beautiful. Okay. Yeah. We are looking forward to hear her performance tomorrow night, but before we listen to her voice singing, we listen to her speaking out 
I don't know which I like the most. Well, both. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I'm dead. already playing with the, with, the, with the award. Anyway, so let the show begin. Let's listen to what she has for us today in conversation with the author of the online and print magazine, Gal Dem, Nati Kazambala. Thank you very much and welcome to Barcelona. Thank you. Where should I go? Uh -huh. Hi. Oh, it has a little house. Amazing. <laughs> it has a house. That's very cute. Oh, that's lovely. God, it's uh, beautifully done, isn't it? The detail is so nice. Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you. So, where should we go then? I'm sorry. <laughs> This is my mic. Yeah, my mic so. sounds nice. <laughs> Check one, one, two. Oh my god! So Hi. I'm about to drop into a freestyle. Ah, <laughs> okay. Hey, everybody. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so we are here with Nana Cherry. Um, just to second everything that was just said over there. Amazing stuff. I feel like I can see myself, even though I'm nowhere near your levels of achievement in the way that you are like, I don't feel like I deserve this, but you definitely do, so. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> just, thank you. Yeah, I was a little bit overwhelmed. Yeah, is it? <laughs> it must be so hard taking, I don't know. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I figured we'd start at the start of your career, get the big moment out of the way and just kind of go retrospectively and then look at like your career today and how everything's changed and just, you know, the journey you've been on. Um, so if we start back in 1988, um, with the Top of the Pops moment, um, I just, yeah, I just wanted to get this out of the way to start with, like when you went out and you performed Buffalo Stance, Seven Months Pregnant, did you know that that moment was going to be the moment that it became? And how do you feel about that moment this far down the line? I mean, I, I don't think that I kind of knew what the, the overall kind of tidal wave that, and that we would still be talking about it mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I feel like before I got to that place, I'd already had a whole journey, exactly. you know, and I moved to London when I was like 16 and I, I was in a... Uh, worked with a group called The Slits, and then I was in a band called Rip, Rig and Panic, and then we became Float Up CP, and, you know, so there was a whole trip mm. that led up to that, that kind of joint, you know, that yeah. place. And I think that for the first time when um, we were doing more like sushi, in fact, Cameron's sitting down there, and we might ask him to come up and talk a bit with us because we've been collaborating for since then, Day one. <laughs> since <laughs> that long. Um, but, you know, it was the first time that I kind of went out into the so-called public eye kind of on that level, mm. like doing something like Top of the Pops, which was like, you know, it was all about that mm. in those days, like the internet and all of that stuff obviously wasn't really on the, on the, <laughs> on the line. Yeah. Um, so, you know, England was all about Top of the Pops or getting Radio 1. Mm. Um, and, you know, it was the first time that I was out there. I mean, we were definitely a family of people working on the project mm -hmm. together. Cameron being one of them, Judy Blame, you know, doing the visuals. But, um, you know, having Tyson in my belly at that point and being seven months pregnant actually became like a shield of armor. Do you know what I mean? Because I think one of the things that I, I obviously was very conscious of were all the sort of stereotypical loopholes that were on offer for girls and young women. Yeah. Uh, of that kind of obvious look of, you know, abusing your sexuality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Especially and, at that time. And, yeah, and well, I didn't, yeah. So, so, and I got pregnant. I mean, you know, I did the things that I did that knocks you up. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> As we do. But Which yeah, I didn't necessarily plan. I mean, it wasn't, I mean, I'm, you know, it's of course one of the best things that ever happened to me, Tyson. Mm. But it wasn't planned, mm. you know. Was that scary and kind of? It wasn't really scary. I think that I was just questioning a little bit for a few minutes, not for very long. Like, um, wow, I'm here. I've actually signed a record deal uh, and now I'm pregnant. And instinctually, <laughs> like, that's kind of how we live. And I think family's always been in the center. And I've never felt like I wasn't going to be able to work or do the things that I need to do. My mother used to take me to, in my basket when she was still at, at college studying design, I used to sit, on, you know, sleep under her desk. So I kind of moved with my kids. Yeah. I always took them with me. I come from a West African heritage. I went to Africa in my teens. All the women around me, I mean, not all the women, but I saw so many women doing everything with their yeah. kids. And, yes. you know, you don't see any whiny, hear whiny kids <laughs> in that way because yeah. everyone's close. You know, maybe there's other issues, of course. Anyway, so, um, but, so one of the things that happened leading up to getting on top of the pops was actually being with our really close friend and kind of, um, you know, one of our godfathers, Ray Petrie, who was a sort of the front person or the kind of um, father figure of the sort of Buffalo mm. posse. We were sitting in Soho Square and Cam and I had been on a trip to Holland trying to figure out um, how, what we were doing. <laughs> Can relate. I was pregnant. It's like, what do we, how, yeah. But... I think in a way it was a no-brainer, and especially when I was sitting in Soho Square with Ray Petrie, who was then suffering from AIDS. It was full-blown. He was not going to uh, maybe live for that much longer. And he just said to me, like, I don't think I'm going to make it. You know, I'm on my way out, and this new life that's coming in, it's a good thing, you know, and I was like... So I just yeah, went, like, I have to do it. So, uh, you know, and I, I don't think that I ever thought that I wasn't going to do it. Mm. But I went up to my, um, the guy, Ashley Newton, who was the head of Circa Records at that point, my A&R man. I went in there and I was like, Ashley, I'm pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> Pause and he's board. one of those people that has like... You know, he, when he buys a, a, a coffee table, like photographic book, he buys two copies... You know, one that he puts on the shelf and one to look at. Wow. So his thing is like very OCD organized kind of, and he was just, you could just see him go, oh, yeah, okay. Yay? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Uh, um, but so, uh, so in fact, it just became a really important part of mm. the journey. Mm. And Tyson was within me from the beginning of the, uh, you know, the album being made until pretty much, uh, yeah, when we did the video for Manchild, she was six weeks old, so she was out by then. So Amazing. I think it just helped us in a way, like in a very natural way, just take it out kind of yeah. left of centre. Mm, mm, on you know? such a mainstream platform And just well. taking it out of, uh, in a way that I think really suited who I am and um so I feel like your career has had so many different peaks of like different kinds in different metrics which isn't always the case I feel like some people have quite a straight trajectory you do this and then you win this and then you get that and then that's like it's all very linear like do you have any career highlights that stick out as like the moment that you realize that like this was just like you this was either amazing or you'd done what you wanted to do or, you know, you just, you sat back and you were like, and they just sit. I, I've never, you know, I still don't feel like ready at really? all. I still feel very like, um, I guess in a way, looking at maybe something so like the kind of time over all like sushi and everything that happened there really quickly. Mm feeling also very conscious of like when we came to the end of that campaign and then started working on homebrew 
and feeling a need to be more introspective and kind of reflective that I was interested in what I might be doing when I'm 80 yeah. and, and how I'm going to reach there mm -hmm. rather than just maintain, you know, feeding the, the yeah, fire. The beast. the beast. And, you know, Cameron had started working on Massive Attack around the time we did um, Homebrew. And that was like really medicinal, just like having them in the house working and hearing the music. And then, of course, there's been moments. There's always like these moments. So like yeah. one thing that sticks out was like me and Judy Blame and Cameron went to Jamaica when I was seven months. Uh, it was the Christmas of uh, the Buffalo Stance Christmas. Oh, <laughs> as we call it in the books. <laughs> we went to Jamaica and we were sitting on the beach. It was like, I think we'd, we would stayed outside Ocho Chirios and then we'd gone to Montego Bay to get the flight back, maybe. And then we were like, if the record doesn't go up, we're going to stay another week. We were like sitting next to some sound system and like watching all these women going in the water with their hair nets <laughs> and T-shirts and just rago. We were like, let's just... We were kind of wishing the record yeah. to not go up. <laughs> and then we were sitting there and Cam went and made a call and came back and he was like, it's number three. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, damn. Yeah, so we, so we went back. But that was quite a... That's what we a call a win-win situation. Yeah. Um, and then I guess, like, being in my brother's apartment, again, with Cam, writing seven seconds, mm. that was quite, I mean, you know, quite a trip. And just feeling that we were kind of putting these pieces together um, that felt you know like, like cohesive yeah and then Yusu came in on like the third day and just being in this in like uh, my brother's kind of studio stroke bedroom and hearing his voice kind of soaring around the room it was Stop, quite like, it was yeah. quite a trip um, that um, man child when we were gluing together man child and I guess also going coming forward a bit um maybe making the thing record mm. um, the day the first time we got together to record we had like two sessions and we did three songs just in one take each yeah. and and we did this um, MF Doom song called Accordion and I just kind of did it in in one take and I was like shit I just licked the MF Doom <laughs> tune in one take I was like Amazing. hey and then I got a migraine but it, but that was quite that was kind of ama uh, quite amazing I think also because it was really the first thing that I'd done in f yeah. for so long did it you feel know? like a comeback did it feel but I don't it just felt like a release more than a, I don't I don't really like that kind of term comeback mm. I'm always like comeback from what living, <laughs> living like, life I'm here yeah yeah <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, leading on to that, when you was that break in, uh, not a break in life, but a break in like solo records, was that intentional? Did you always know that you were going to come back to releasing stuff by yourself? Um, how, how was that time for you? And then how did it feel to come back into quite a different industry? Mm, I, I mean, uh, I don't think, like, I didn't kind of say ever that I had, it wasn't like some kind of a retirement mm. kind of plan, you know what I mean? It was just like, um, I think I just needed to not be in the center and to kind of move off center. So we had a project called Circus, which was uh, a band kind of collective thing where uh, I was a part of it and, you know, I kind of, did quite a lot of collaborations and other yeah. things. Um, but uh, that it ended up being 17 years is kind of absurd. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, I think about it now and I'm like, oh my God. But I guess, I mean, I never thought that I wasn't uh, ever going to yeah, release you just a song. I was just like, kind of in a way, I suppose, waiting to reach the right time. Because I just think... Anytime I've tried to record or write or say things when I'm not really there, when it's not really mm. right, I mean, I'm not a particularly amazing 
singer, you know, I haven't got the most like amazing voice, but I think, but what I'm trying to say, it's like, it's yeah. about the spirit and mm. the presence and where it comes from. And I guess in a way, like, I just wasn't there yeah. until that time. And then, of course, I, you know, I'd, I'd lost my mother in 2009, which was a huge drama. Um, and that sent me, you know, catapulted me out into a pretty difficult space. But it was something about that that also took me to that kind of desperation of needing to be creative because mm -hmm. I think the actual, the things that I talk about or that I can say creatively, which is not just about the things that you're actually saying in the words that you're yeah. singing. It's about opening the things that, the channels. Yeah. Um, can run so much deeper than any words. Mm. So I think also it was like I had to because otherwise I was probably going to actually just kind of remain quite crazy. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think so. So and like it was actually theory. Cam and a friend of ours, Connie, we were living in Stockholm at the time, that had seen the thing playing. And Cam came back and he was just like, this is the right thing right now. You need to do something with these guys. Mm. Um, and of course, also there was the, fam the connection of, I mean, their um, band is named after a, a song title, I think, that from a record that my, my dad, my stepdad, Don Cherry, had made. They were really improvised. I mean, it, it, um, what's the word? Inspired mm. by a lot of the music that I grew up in. Mm. And then also we were coming from a similar kind of time frame age-wise. So they have listened to a lot of the same music as yeah. me in life. So it ended up being just like the way in. And it was a really, you know, powerful Journey, you know, journey, actually. Um, and then, oh, sorry, going back to that initial move to London when you're at the age of 15, um, and you'd kind of been moving around in Sweden and America, and you were pretty, like, travelled anyway, for at least for a 15-year-old. Um, what inspired that move, and how did you even, like, at that age, know that that was what you needed to do? Uh, I don't. I don't know that I exactly knew that it was yeah. what I needed to do. But yeah, I guess something instinctually and just something that I found there. I mean, initially it was a friendship with Ari Up, the singer of the Slits. Mm -hmm. We just kind of, yeah, made like a sisterhood, you know. And she was still living with her mother Nora in South London. Um, we'd met on a tour that. They'd invited my dad on. It was like a reggae band, Prince Hammer, Creation Rebel, Don Cherry, and, and the Slits. Yes. They'd just kind of quite newly then discovered jazz. And so they were like, yeah, let's bring all these people on this, this tour. And I had dropped out of school. Um, yeah, I grew up kind of traveling between New York and Sweden. Um, so when I got to London, I guess there was a kind of, uh, of course, the people that I met, mm. but also feeling like a kind of freedom. Um, Sweden was really difficult for me as I got older. Yeah, why was that? Big, well, you know, I grew up, I was born in Stockholm, but I grew up in a really, you know, tiny little kind of, you could call, almost call it a shit <laughs> <laughs> But it's nice. It. The village that my house is in is great. And, you know, our house is a trip. We call it the mothership. It's an old school house. But the community, so the little school that I went to mm -hmm. from grade one to sixth grade was just tiny and, you know, I, I kind of knew everybody. But then when I moved over into the junior high school, that just, like, became really difficult. I think, you know, I can quite comfortably say now that I feel quite proud of 
the part of me that I would relate to as being very Swedish. But when I was growing up, I mean, there was one, there was my brother, and there were two other black kids in the school that were um, adopted from Ethiopia. And when I got into the biggest school, there wasn't really any anybody, mm -hmm. you know. And I was, I think I struggled a lot with, on one hand, feeling really proud of who I am, but then also struggling with, you know, wanting to be accepted and wanting to be, you know, uh, accepted as just even being Swedish. Mm. You know, and it was a kind of crazy duality and really hard, I think. Yeah. Hard, harder than, than I probably was able to take on board, yeah. if you know what I mean. I feel like when you remove yourself from those situations, that's when you fully yeah. understand. Yeah, it's like shit, that was really yeah. difficult. And I guess every, every half year or so we would go to America and that was always a godsend because, of course, I could just feed, you know, my hungry spirit mm. with We were talking about music this, yeah. And, and how you used to listen to like Minnie Ripperton and you said that you um, were kind of like consuming a lot of black culture and then had obviously the reverse where you were like in Sweden, like and you were talking about you, you and your friend who used to mime to ABBA um, back in the day. And like, I, yeah, I wanted to talk a bit more about that and how you eventually like reconciled the two parts and how how you think it inspired I don't know your sense of self later but I guess you've kind of covered that I mean I think it's just that thing of like feeling weird all the time mm. like wherever you go and just realizing you know maybe not even that long ago that that kind of idea of belonging is so much more random, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And actually feeling weird or being a bit weird or being kind of an awkward person and constantly feeling a little bit like you're on the periphery of things is actually okay. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> that, that can yeah. be, Literally. you know what I mean? That can actually be kind of a beautiful thing also. Mm. Um, but for sure, to go back to kind of going to live in London mm. and what I found there and like Ari who was very deep into sound system culture and like going to like Ballet High and to hear Jashaka and you know the big sound systems that were around at that time, Stereograph and so Coxon and whoever they all were, you know, that that deep environment was also a big thing for me at the time in London of kind of you know, there was a, I mean, it was a very political era on one hand, <laughs> for sure, yeah. you know, and um, also quite a, a free kind of environment, you know. When How do you feel looking back on that now since, like, since you've been a parent? Would you ever have let your kids go and be like, like if um, <laughs> you lived in Sweden and one of your children was like, yeah, we're moving to London... I'm doing this thing, 16, would you let them? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> the pressure's on. Would, it, would I let them? I mean... <laughs> so I mean, I think I, I can... I, yeah, I can definitely be a bit of a... Um, not concerned, but, you know, I worry about my mm -hmm. kids. It's like I didn't really know what fear was until I had children. Really? And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, my God, you know, all this <laughs> fucking shit that can happen to my kids. <laughs> oh, my God. But, I mean, I think the whole idea of, like, you know, you have a child and I just feel like I've looked at my girls and you're like, wow, they're, you know, it's a person. They're born as themselves. And so your job as a parent is to just try and help them be yeah. that as my, you know, Ugh. you know? Yeah. And so I think, um, I mean, so I feel like we've always tried to support them in what they mm. were doing. But sometimes I just think like, oh my God, you know, I look at um, Mabel now, who's 23, and I mean, I had a five-year-old daughter when I was 23. <laughs> you're like, you're my baby and you'll stay that way forever. Like, yeah, I don't know. But um, 
But I think, yeah, I mean, as neurotic as I can be <laughs> in the love for my kids, I also think they're the most amazing people and that, you know, what I, I would always support them, I think, yeah. in the things that, 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 that are calling them and driving them. And then looking at your, like, immediate family and everyone around you, from your parents to your kids as well, like, and how everyone in some form is an artist, like, was there ever a moment where you didn't consider going down that route or was it always the way... No, I mean, I think as a reaction to the world Things that I grew up you. in, I mean, I definitely had a concept at some point that I was going to be a nurse. Really? <laughs> it was like <laughs> the most sort of exotic kind of thing that I could think is that I would live in a bungalow and like <laughs> have a German shepherd and drive a Volvo and oh, be a nurse. It didn't so happen. <laughs> <laughs> I still can't drive a car. Oh, me and I don't live in a bungalow and it didn't happen. But, you know, my house... Mm. And both the loft that we had in New York and my house at the old schoolhouse and tour guide, like my mother, who was an incredibly incredible person, and her creativity was, you know, it didn't just end and start in whatever she was working on as an artist. It was just like our whole living space, everything was about her creativity and art to as a part of life. Mm. So, you know, my house has a, had a purple room, a yellow room, a, a blue room, uh, you know, fabric hanging from the ceilings. It didn't look like anybody else's house in the hood. <laughs> so, <laughs> and after she died and we unpeeled the loft um, that we had for 30 years uh, in Long Island City, there was just layers and layers and layers of the whole thing. It was like an installation. Amazing. You know, so, oh. uh, yeah, so I don't even know what your question way. was, but art anyway. Was always, <laughs> art was always the way, is basically the but answer there. Yeah, yeah, so I think, I mean, I think, like, I know that my parents were definitely, even if they were worried when I went off mm. to spend time in London and ended up staying there, I think they were actually kind of happy. I think they were more worried about me when I was like running around with the local hoodlums in Hesleholm, <laughs> in the backwaters of nowhere, with a bunch of people who like are pretty weird and like drive vintage cars and literally have like Confederate flags and they're, you know, oh, like bordering on being pretty racist tribe. And I was like trying to, you know, dwell within those walls. It was like not a good plan. So my mother was like, just happy. In fact, one of my teachers, when she went to get leave, you know, mm. so that I could not go to school, um, get time off or whatever, she was just like, yeah, great, get her out of here. <laughs> get out. Go find get, your people. Yeah, get, Be free. Get out. <laughs> okay, cool. And then moving on to, you know, like the later stage of your career that we're in now, um, when you, I guess we kind of talked a little bit about re-entering the, the, or not re-entering, but re, like re, the release of more music of your own in, in the industry so, so much later than your other stuff. Did you feel different in the age of streaming and like, like singled focus markets and, you know, like, but also at the same time, the growth of like independent success and, you know, Tyler the Creator just went to number one in America and yeah, there's possibilities... So how did you feel re-entering and releasing music into that space? I mean, I think I'm actually a bit of a ditz <laughs> because I don't, really, I don't really think about how different it is. Really? I think also possibly because, um, because I find myself in a place as a woman, a 55-year-old woman, where, okay, of course, yeah, right? <laughs> Bring it. Um, where, okay, I'm not saying that I don't notice that there are differences. Of course, you know, um, I'm using social media and I'm, you know, dead later you can do. And, you know, we need to be out here playing live because we're not going to make any money on record sales mm -hmm. and so on, et cetera, et cetera. But I also feel like as a person, maybe the 
great thing, like the kind of nice thing. Well, there's a lot of nice things about being a 55-year-old woman. But is that I don't really feel like I have to make so many excuses anymore. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or whatever. I, I just feel, or apologize, or... And I'm not trying to be where, for instance, Mabel is. Yeah. You know, a, a mainstream artist. I just feel, like, of course, blessed to be sitting here, to have great things happening. Oh, is that our clock running out? But... Um, um, was me. But it wasn't actually me. Do you know what I mean? But I just... So, so for me, I guess the things that are changing and that have changed... I try and take them in my stride Mm. Um, and to just, to be able to do whatever it is that we need to do right now. You know what I mean? But I think that I'm I'm a little bit of a kind of a typical Pisces kind of space cadet. (laughs) So I just kind of adapt quite easily Mm. and just kind of get on with it and then working with a mixture of people. So we have like the band is a real mixture of mm-hmm. age, ages and like my manager that I'm working with now who's sitting over there, Robin, he's quite a lot, you know, younger. So I think also that it keeps a balance. So the way that things are ticking over are also mm-hmm. quite, a, you know, a it's normal. Like evolving. Yeah. Same. But I just, I don't know. I mean, I've always been a bit like this, you know. I just kind of get, I just kind of, get on with it. I don't sort of necessarily sit around thinking about how many followers I have or how many people bought the record or do you know what I mean? But I enjoy all the the new things that that happen along the way as they unfold. And obviously your last two records were were produced with Cameron and Kieran Hebden, aka Fortet. How did that collaboration come about and was that a conscious decision or did it just happen naturally? Uh, well, it was definitely a conscious decision that happened naturally. <laughs> um, do you want to come and talk with us a little bit about Karen and, huh? Yeah, I'm you're doing, doing great. Right. Be nice. Come on. <laughs> Yay, Cameron. I just feel like... Uh, I just think it's uh, nice to actually sit here and talk about our collaboration a bit as it's such an important part of what we do. But, um, do a little test. Do a little test. Say yo. Is there a button? Is it not? It's on. Hello. Yeah. Hi, Cameron. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, we were talking about Kieran Fortet. Um, obviously produced the last two records and on the last one it was entirely electronically produced yeah well we we did a we had a three tier plan to rope him in over three <laughs> albums so he did a remix on the thing record yeah oh, amazing I stalked him from when he was 19 basically really yeah so like I would always be, he was in a band called the F- Fridge yeah. yeah and then uh then you got turned on to him when I started going to see him. Yeah. And then on this, the next record, he just twiddled the knobs. We went up to Woodstock to work with him, and he just twiddled the knobs on the, on the album with uh, Rocket <laughs> Number 9. And on the last album, we persuaded him to do everything. Mm. And he did everything. He did everything, yeah. But we'd already made the record, and then he remade it, sort of thing. Really? Yeah, our process is long. So you Super kind of, fun. like, recorded the music, and then he used his own bank of sounds? We, we basically wrote... All the tracks. Actually, with some of Kieran's, he sent us a few beats and a few bit, bit, bits and pieces. So we spent... Um, a long time. Qu- quite a long time. Not too long. In the studio, at our, in our studio at our house. Mm-hmm. Um, and had a really... Actually, what I think was one of our closest kind of writing yeah, we journeys. Held hands. We held hands a lot. <laughs> Since, Candles like, holding hands. Yeah, it was kind of deep. And so we did all the, the tracks. We had them all ready when we went to meet with Kieran. And then we had seven working days or five? No, five. We had five working days to do ten, no, eight tracks. Eleven. Eleven, um, yeah, Eleven. something like that. And uh, basically he was just banging them out. And there was one track that he didn't see that I just got obsessed about. And bless him, he went and did an all-nighter at home and then came back in with the result the next day. And said, wow. I, yeah, which turned out to be the, kind of the best track on the record. 
Really? Shotgun Shack. Oh, yeah. yeah, he didn't get it. He was just like, the chords are weird. And, you know, we have this little Casio um, keyboard thing, mm. which um, I wrote Man Child on, which was also like the first time that I wrote with the, the, the predictive chord. What's it called? The chord? Auto chord. Auto chord. Um, so I'd been Shotgun Shack from Broken Politics is an auto chord uh, track. And so the, the chords are a bit weird. And then I think you changed some of them. And he was just like, doesn't make sense. And then Cam was like, no, it's a good pop song. Just like figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I kept calling it the pop song and he didn't really understand the concept, but then he got it. He did, <laughs> he did an all-nighter. He's great though because he, he sent us beats. So it was a three-plong. Three we did one lot with our own beats. Then we, in, we made our songs fit with his beats. And the rule was we weren't going to change the speed of any of his beats. So we very speeded Nana's vocals on the entire tracks to fit with Kieran Beats, mm -hmm. thinking that he would use those beats to produce the record. And I think he only kept one, didn't he? One loop. And then he switched them out. He switched them all out over the... I've been horrified all the way through the week. Not one thing existed, but he literally made a whole album in five days. And we didn't work late once, did we? <laughs> no, no, we were, like, finished at... At seven. He's incredible and he's really good at collaboration. So we were doing vocals in one part of the studio, he'd be making beats and another guy was doing rough mixes in another mm. bit. So mm. he's, he's pretty, uh, he's pretty work-like. Did it feel weird to rely on technology to that extent? No, we're pretty lazy. So I mean, technology <laughs> rocks. You're like, sweet. No. Yeah. And I think you kind of, the good thing about working with him is he's a real digger from the past. So he's got an amazing knowledge of records and mm. our record collection which started with her dad and tour gap in the in the house is an incredible collection so a lot of what we do is based on that record collection so when we have family get-togethers those records and those beats become where we're going to go mm. next kind of thing which is why we're just about to go there again now and go digging like and and, and he's got an incredible knowledge of so if i'll come with a beat he'll know where that beat came from he'll know the 10 records that went out to make it singers producers engineers he'll have the whole thing he's, he's incredible yeah. yeah he's 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 deep he's, so he's deep so i think no there was nothing and it was actually in answer to your question what was really beautiful was also how yes he made this except for the the vibraphone in Synchronized Devotion, which Professor Carl Berger played, everything is looped. But also that he was producing an electronic sound that was so kind of organic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that had so much air and it had like to breathe. Yeah. It was it like fascinating to see and hear? Um, and we talked a little bit about um, how your song writing process has changed over the years, but I was saying to you how uh, Ezra Koenig was recently talking about how as a career progresses, lyrics become more and more important to an artist's, like, I guess, expression. Um, and I don't know whether that's necessarily true, but do you feel like there are parts of, aspects of songs that you value more now than you did before? Are you more focused on instrumentation or do you, do you focus more on your lyrics than you did? I mean... <sighs> I mean, I focus a lot on the lyrics because I write, but the instrumentation it's as important. is also such a huge part of what transcends mm. the meaning of the song. She's obsessed with lyrics. Really? <laughs> I mean, you literally will work for hours and hours over two words. Really? Whether they should be this way around or that way around or yeah. probably days. Yeah, I mean, I get... I get and I'm trying to because... Cam is a very kind of Slap prolific. No, but he writes quite f fast. Mm. Um, but so it's been, I guess, over the years, it's been uh, an interesting and also a really good push for me because our collaboration, it being what it is, has also made me be able to kind of throw out things a bit more. But I guess I think of each song as a in a way, almost like a picture, uh, a story, a short story. And um, if I think of like a song like Inner City Mama, I can see the picture that I had in my head when I was writing it mm. or um, Move With Me, which was a track on Homebrew. You know what I mean? I can yeah. see the, 
there was a line in it that goes, um, move with me, something about a sea of people. I can't even remember the fucking lyrics. <laughs> but I, I know that I was thinking about like Fifth Avenue in New York in rush hour mm. when there's just like literally just bodies. Sea of people. Yeah, sea of people. Um, I'm a grain of sand in a sea of people. There you go. That was it. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so, but we have, a, we have an interesting, funny way of writing because sometimes I come with kind of like a, a full song, kind of like a, you know, yeah. verse pretty much that's, and Cam and I will just knock it into shape. And then other times Cam, I'll just be like literally like just like rambling a bunch of, sounds and words into a, a recorder and Cam will be able to just pull out the, the diamonds. That's it. And what else happens? I was just yeah. thinking, <laughs> when we bought our first house, second house, where we just, um, and I remember once watching you in the garden and there was, we were having a lot of building work done because when we move into a house, the first thing we build is the studio always, then the kitchen and then we work out from there, then we move that in. That shows the priority. Priority, get, <laughs> get your money in. And so we were out in the garden and there were a full team of Irish builders working in the house. It was a big house and there were people all over the house working. And there was a guy outside, you know what, like a buzz saw is, it's like where, you, where you're cutting through big lumps of very thick plywood. It's really noisy, really messy. Right next to where she was working out on the picnic table in the garden, there was a guy, nee! with the radio on, singing full volume, with the radio, with the buzz saw. And Nana's next to him, literally completely oblivious to all this noise, utterly, completely, working on another song, completely nothing to do, and was there for like two hours with this guy next to her writing a song. So did you notice the guy? No. What, what guy? Oh, my God. That's kind of where she goes. In the zone. Yeah. Amazing. That's kind of how it works in the studio as well. We kind of like, you go in and the last record that we made, I remember the kids coming in and kind of creeping around the door and saying it was really sweet because we had candles and we were holding hands and... They're like, mum and dad are in the studio. It's so cute. <laughs> it's kind of revolting, right? But <laughs> um, and, and, and one more story. The, the, quite a lot of the lyrics on this record. Nana had to chaperone Mabel, our youngest, who's having a quite a lot of pop success now. She had to chaperone her around to a few studios because we'd just come to England. She grew up in Sweden. we just moved back. And Nana had to take her to Leeds, was it, or Manchester? Both. Right, Manchester and Leeds. So she wrote quite a lot of the lyrics waiting in the hotel for Mabel to go to writing sessions with various kind of northern producers. Yeah. That were your best tunes. Oh, yeah. few, few of the, like, deep vein thrombosis. But I used the vocals like, I, off, the, off the dictaphone. Yeah. That's yeah. so funny. So, like, some of Mabel's discography and yours were it's, written they're, in the same yeah, space. They're crossing over. Crossing over. Um, yeah. Do you have something else? You no, I was just going to say, yeah, like, deep vein thrombosis, which is on Broken Politics, mm. was written in a weird hotel room in Leeds. <laughs> <laughs> and, and on the new album as well, I feel like you collaborated with, or your visual creative as well was incredible. And I really love the video directed by Crack Stevens as well. And I was just wondering, to finish off before we ask for some questions, um, if there are other emerging creatives or artists that you're looking oh my God. forward to collaborating with? Um, yeah, I, I'm really crap in situations like this of like thinking of a names. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I always seem to just like... I mean, I'm really... Um, I really like Forest Swords. Oh, wow. Visual and, I mean, of course, his, his music, but the sort of... He does a lot of his own mm. um, visuals and I'd really possibly think it would be quite cool if we did yeah, something with him. But there's, there's a lot of very... Um, interesting artists, filmmakers. I mean, Baffic, I love. Still haven't managed to actually do... Yeah, we did a video, actually, on the last album. I tell a lie. Um, but, yeah, that, anyone, that's to look forward to. Mm, anyone you've been stalking, Cameron? Benji Flo. Benji Flo. <laughs> He's sick. Big time Benji Flo. He won't answer any of my messages, though. <laughs> oh, they're always like we'll that. We'll get to him. At the, at the start. You can, like, break them down. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, do we have time for questions? Sweet. Anyone got any questions? <clears throat> oh, oh, there's a... Something over there. Do you want to still... You're really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know about that. 
Hi. Hi. Uh, hello. Uh, Anuri Nair, I actually live in Su Stockholm, so so beautiful to hear your journey. From, oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I really, you know, I just was reading this article recently about just kind of this, the kind of your personality and how it shows up in your music and you're kind of a person that's a blend of many places, a blend of many, you know, genres as well. Um, there's a, you know, recent book that written about like the punk scene and feminism as uh, someone who's been such a huge part of the whole music industry. How do you see the culture of today, you know, broken politics, like they say, is kind of an ageless look at the times. Um, what, what, how do you see like culture being defined right now in the music industry? Thank you. So what was the last, very last word you say? How do I see the culture defined? Yeah, in the, in, through your music and, you know, like being, having seen it from the time you were like doing the punk scene to now, like. I mean, I think maybe what's quite interesting about now is that maybe we don't have to be so de like going on and on about what we're defining, but that people, whoever we might be, whatever color we are, whatever we have to say, that we feel that we can take space and occupy space, use up more room, and that goes for you know men, women, whatever we are. Um, without having to say, maybe always like, this is specifically why I'm here and this is what I have to say. Maybe it's enough to just be there, you know, and to be in life and to feel that you are heard and seen. And I think that this is starting to happen. But I mean, obviously, we're also part of a really difficult time politically in the world, you know, I mean... America is right, won by a white supremacist, misogynist. <laughs> it's like, and England is, you know, I mean, is a fucking mess. And, you know, and so, but I think um, that maybe I feel that, you know, out of this mess, it's also making us reactive, you know, and making more noise is a good thing about, you know, in, about, about the things that we don't want. But do you know what I mean? That's not really the right English. But, so it's going to be quite interesting. I see how things evolve over the next few years. I think a lot's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, we fight for that. Mm. Mm. I don't know if that answers your questions, you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm just like... I love what you said, like making a lot of noise of what we don't want. Yeah, I think... <laughs> it's slightly awkward English, but hey. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Congratulations on your award. Um, thank, thank you, Cameron, you. for joining us as well. And thank you guys. Oh, oh, oh. I was just wondering if you gave uh, your daughter Mabel advice on her music <laughs> and her um, success in the pop industry. And uh, yeah, if you gave her advice on the music side of things. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't want our advice. I think the, the main thing that I say to her is own it. You know? Own it and be yourself. That's it. Sick. Okay. Uh, can I just say that uh, both of you have soundtracked my whole life, uh, either your songs or productions. I'm... Uh, I live in Greece, by the way, and I came Hi. for Primavera, and uh, that was my main uh, event I wanted to attend. Uh, I want to ask something uh, a bit boring, but uh, because it's the um, 30 years since Roll Like Shoesy was uh, released, are there any plans for a release? Like, <laughs> because now the kids uh, like vinyl. I mean, I have my vinyl copy, 
But it would be nice to have like all the remixes and the yeah. There's, there's, it's going to come out this year, I think. Uh, oh, okay. October, November, November, November. Yes. Finger, with some fingers, fingers crossed. crossed. <laughs> with a lot of bits that you hadn't heard before, kind of tucked in there. Amazing. And then there's talk of another thing which I'm not allowed to talk about next year, which is connected. Oh, okay. So we're going to keep Amazing. coming back, but it's difficult because when you do the new stuff, you have to keep going between the new and the old. So. It's yeah. how to keep those things connected and relevant. Otherwise, you become an antique, and no, no, no. that you don't I think want. The best is to look forward, but also yeah. respect your past. Bring, bring, bring the history with. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Is that everything? Thank you guys for coming. Yeah. Thank you so much for sitting here and listening. And thank you. Thank you, Ken. <laughs>